Well, it is good to see you tonight, and uh, glad to see you back in the house of the Lord. Let's get a book turned to page 130, 130 tonight, as we stand and sing. Hope you had a good afternoon, and I thank the Lord to be able to be back tonight. Amen. <clears throat> Precious bleeding sun. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's do pray tonight for the service. And then let's remember tonight many of those among our church that are sick this evening. Let's continue to pray for Brother Melvin that God will touch him, strengthen him, and the Lord will touch and meet the need there. Amen. Also, Brother Stookum, let's remember him tonight in prayer and all the others among the church tonight that needs a touch from heaven. I know Brother Combs has got to go uh, have some more skin cancer removed. And, uh, she said she thought he had a place on his face that was infected a little bit today, and so he may go back tomorrow. So let's remember Brother Combs uh, tonight that God will touch him. And uh, then if you will remember Spring. Spring's been having quite a few health problems. And, of course, she had surgery several weeks ago and uh, still undergoing some uh, uh, shots for that. And she's got one more. Thank God. Hopefully that will be over with. But uh, she's got to go Thursday, have an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. And so pray that everything will be well there. And uh, the Lord will just touch her. Amen. Remember all the others tonight, especially those in our families that are lost, that God will deal with their hearts and pray that the Lord just meet the need in their lives. Any other requests tonight before we pray? Well, let's get the ushers to come tonight and receive our offering. Let's remember Curtis and Carson. Remember, remember them. Amen. Remember Donna also, remember, pray for Donna. There are some health issues, so let's remember her. Remember Brother Mike, he's got knees going out on him, so let's pray for him, amen. 
And we'll touch it. Amen. Any others? All right, well, let's pray tonight. Pray for the service. Brother Reed, pray for us tonight. Let's all stand and turn to page 228. Let's sing Amazing Grace tonight.
Amen. You can be seated. is easy when you're up on the mountain you've got peace of mind like you've never known but in the valley there's trials and temptations that's
no matter what. Conditions are, no matter what may be going on in your life, I'm glad God's still God. Amen. He is the God of the mountain, but He is also God of the valley. And I'm thankful for that because we spend a lot of time in the valleys, a lot of time on the mountains. And I'm glad the Lord's the same, no matter what. Amen. If you have your Bible this evening, I want you to turn with us to the book of Matthew, chapter number six this evening. Matthew chapter number 6, again it is good to see all of you here tonight, appreciate all of you being here, don't forget now two weeks from today, uh, on Sunday right after the morning service, uh, Living in Victory is going to be providing a barbecue lunch, and uh, I think it's $10, it's going to be barbecue, and, uh, vegetables, and desserts, different things like that, and drinks, and so if you can, make plans on staying and being here two weeks from today. Uh, that would be a great blessing to help as they raise money uh, to go back to a rise next summer. And then also next Sunday, morning and night, Brother Paul Mustin will be here preaching. So I hope you'll be much in prayer and invite folks to come. And I know Brother Paul and his family, they'll be a blessing as they sing and see preaches. And then pray for us as we'll be in revival meeting uh, down in Edenton, North Carolina with the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Brother John Keeter is the pastor. And I pray that the Lord will just give us a great meeting. Amen. In Matthew chapter number 6, and I want to begin reading in verse number 9, a very familiar passage that we find here during the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus is given the Beatitudes and different things. But we find that he begins to talk to them about prayer. And then, of course, here in verse number 9, we find uh, Jesus giving them the model prayer. And in verse number 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you again for the privilege to be here in your house on the Lord's Day. Thankful, Lord, for everyone in the building tonight, those who are watching. God, we pray again for the many requests that have been made known throughout the day today, those who are sick, asking you, God, to touch them, raise them up, my Father. For we know that you are the great physician. We're praying, Lord, for those that are discouraged, those that have got out of your will, God, that you would help them and God, speak to their heart. Lord, we do pray tonight that you'd help us as we study the Word of God, that, Lord, your Word would speak to us and help us. God, we need your touch tonight, and I pray that you'd help us. And all that's done, we'll thank you, we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach tonight from these verses, and I want to preach on this thought, important principles for the Christian life. Now, I believe there are three principles upon which the Christian life must surely be lived. And if it is to be lived adequately and worthily. And the principles are in these words, if we can really say them, as we find in verse number 14 or verse number 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Now, I believe as we look at this verse that we can find some important principles that will help us to live our lives for Christ. I preached this morning that we are ambassadors for Christ. We're to be representatives of the Lord. 
the United States of America has ambassadors to every country. And those ambassadors, when they go to those countries, they are delivering the message from uh, the president or the, or the body there, and they are representatives of that body. Now, you and I, we are the ambassadors of Christ, and we are to be representing him in every aspect of our life, every day that we live. We ought to live and set out to live for Christ. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Every day that Paul lived was a day lived for Jesus. Amen? And that's the way our minds ought to think. And here in this verse, we find three things that I believe will help us if we'll put them into our life, where Jesus said, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The first thing to the Christian life is to live a life controlled by the will of God. Now, I believe all of us need to live in the center of God's will and that we need to be controlled by the will of God. Amen. Now, this is a simple truth. And although it's a simple truth, but yet it seems so difficult for God's people. And our Lord made it very plain when he said, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And he that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. And so we need to be controlled by the will of God. Peter, in his first epistle, says that it is our obedience that there is to be found the ultimate fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose for our lives in and through Christ. He says that we are the elect according to to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, an obedience unto the Lord. An obedience to the Lord is simply letting the will of God control our lives. An obedience that combines the acceptance of the cross and an allegiance to Christ. Now, Jesus made this statement. He said, not everyone, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall uh, enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Now, I believe it's very important. Not everybody that names the name of Christ is going to heaven. I'm sorry to say, uh, just because you claim to be of the Christian faith don't mean you're going to heaven. Amen. you got to be saved to get to heaven. And when you're saved, I believe there's an obedience to the will of God in our life. Now, a life controlled by the will of God, here Jesus said, thine is the kingdom. And so in other words, this means that there will uh, have to be an enlightenment. I cannot do the will of God unless I know what his will is for my life. And so we find Paul praying uh, for the Christians at the church at Colossae. He said in Colossians 1, 9, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We must know the will of God for our lives. There are some things that are plain 
and in the will of God. Some things you don't have to pray about. I didn't have to get up this morning and say, well, Lord, do you really want me to go to church today? No, it's the will of God you go to church. Amen. And a, and a person that claims to be saved has no desire to be in the house of God. I, I really doubt a lot of things about that individual. You say you're judging. No, I'm just looking at the fruit that's being born. I didn't have to pray about going to church today. Amen. Never had to pray about it. It's the will of God. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It, I didn't even have to pray about tithing. That's just the will of God. Amen. Nothing, I mean, there are some things that are plainly the will of God and just be obedient to them. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, as it comes down to our walk with God and what God would have us to do in our lives, then we need to pray, and that's what Paul did. Paul prayed for the Christians at Colossae that they could be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, the Lord sets out the condition of such knowledge in John 7 and 17. If any man is willing to do his will, amen, we will know the will of God. And we must want to know the will of God. And that will mean a willingness to spend some time listening and learning what his will is for our life. Time spent with the Word of God under the guidance of the Spirit of God to find out what the will of God is for my character, for my conduct, for my career, for whatever it is. You can find it in the Word of God. Now, enlightenment, that's, there, there's the problem in a lot of people's lives. How much time do we spend every day reading the Bible, studying the Bible? Are we uh, lazy when it comes to Bible reading? No wonder we don't know what the will of God is. We're not listening. Somebody said, well, I want God to talk to me. Read the Bible. God's not going to say anything to you that's not in this book. Amen? And he's certainly not going to talk to you that of anything that would be contrary to this book. Enlightenment. And so we must know the will of God, and we've got to have enlightenment to know what God's will is. Then secondly, there's got to be involvement. When we find the will of God, and we know the will of God, it has to be lived. It has to be lived out in our lives, amen? And therefore, we must get involved. A lot of people don't want to get involved. But God's will is basically uh, a saving will, a redemptive will, and it all demands action, amen? The Lord's Prayer said, Thy will be done, not suffered, not endured, but done. Involvement, doing it, amen, living it every single day. That's exactly what the Lord wants to do. And the Lord was our pattern in this, our example. When he said to the Father, he said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And so it's that will that led him to the garden of Gethsemane and where he prayed and surrendered himself to the will of God and to Calvary. Beloved, tonight there's got to be enlightenment. We've got to know what the will of God is. And then when we know the will of God, 
We have got to get involved, amen, and do the will of God. So the will of God involves enlightenment. It involves involvement. And then a life controlled by the will of God certainly means enthronement. He's our Lord. Amen. He's Lord of our lives. He's our Lord. Amen. And so we must enthrone him as Lord of all in our lives. And if enthroning him, it, it, it means dethroning others. It means him being first. It means him having his way. He's Lord. He's to be enthroned in our lives. And while the will of God is positive, there are some negative sides of it as well. And uh, so there are some things that we should not allow to control us. Amen. I mean, we shouldn't allow the world to control us. We should not allow other people to control us, but we should be allowing the Lord to have his way in our lives. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul wrote to the Ephesians what had controlled the pattern of the Ephesians before they had gotten saved. He said there, you walked according to, to the course of this world. In other words, you did what everybody else did. Uh, what society, uh, whatever this world decreed that you did. Hey, can I just go ahead and say, it's all right not to be like the world. <laughs> Praise God. I'm telling you, the world's got some crazy ideas. And I'm glad I don't have to be like them. Amen. And... Uh, uh, what everybody else did. That's what we did most of the time. But now we're saved. Now the Lord is Lord of our lives. And we're not to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Uh, we're to desire to fulfill the will of God. That God's desires to be go through our lives. Amen. Oh, listen. Society must be dethroned and Christ enthroned in our lives. Paul, before he got saved, his, he was called Saul of Tarsus. And when Saul met Christ on the Damascus Road, <laughs> I mean, listen, when he saw and knew who Jesus was, this is what he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to do? Christ was enthroned in his life. It was no longer what Saul desired or what the others that controlled Saul wanted him to do. But now he has enthroned Christ and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Amen. Hey, controlled by the will of God. It just simply means enlightenment, knowing God's will. It, it involves involvement, doing the will of God. It's sad if you know what to do and you don't do it. But if you know what to do, do it and get involved in the work of God, in the, in the will of God. And then enthronement. Thine is the kingdom. Amen. We just need to let the Lord have his way in our lives. But the Christian life is to be lived, controlled by the will of God. Secondly, our life should be lived confident in the power of God. Amen. The first thing Jesus said, thine is the kingdom. And uh, notice, what he, look at verse 13. To, for thine is the kingdom, and then he says, and the power. You and I tonight should have all confidence in the power of God. Hey, listen, 
He's got all power. He don't have a little bit of power. He's got all power. He don't just have all power in heaven. He's got all power in earth. He has all power. Amen. And thine is the kingdom. There's the authority under which we live. And I believe that's what we need to understand. Thine is the kingdom, the will of God, the authority that we're living under. But then, thank God, we can do the will of God because we are confident in the power of God. Amen. Praise God. Listen, all power, Jesus said, is given unto me. All authority is given unto me. There's the authority under which you and I live, the power. Thine is the power. There is the adequacy by which we live. You and I can live confidently. I'm glad we don't have to be in doubt because we can have confidence in God's power. Amen. I'm to live confidently in the power of God. Not only am I to say thine is the kingdom, but thine is the power. What confidence marked the early church, amen? But it seems like the church of today is not as confident as they should be in the power of God. Now, I believe tonight as we think about the power and the adequacy which we live, I want you to notice this. The Christian is thinking in terms of a power that has been received. You see, the promise of the Lord to the church at his ascension was this. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Amen. Power. That power, you know what that power will do? That power, it will be given to you to be able to stand for Christ. We can live for Christ because of his power. Power to stand. Where otherwise we would just give away power to be what otherwise I would never be. Power to speak when I would remain silent. Power to love and care where otherwise I would be indifferent. Power to understand. Power to undertake. Power to go where I would never go otherwise. Power. We are confident in the power of God. Thine is not only the kingdom, but thine is the power. Every believer in this building tonight, you have power. You say, how do you know i got power? If the Holy Ghost lives in you, there's power in there. Amen. You just need to unleash the power. Praise God. Oh, the problem with other folks, yes, they don't have the Spirit living in them. But power, every believer has received the Spirit of God. One, uh, Paul asked a group of people, have you received the Holy Ghost? Since she believed, and they said, we haven't heard of the Holy Ghost. We don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. And he said, well, what baptism were you baptized with? And they said, of John. In other words, they didn't know anything about Jesus. All they knew was they were wrong. But they'd never been pointed in the right direction. All they'd ever come to is repentance. Repentance is not enough. You must repent, but yet you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you believe, you're saved. And when you're saved, you're sealed, praise God, with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, listen, uh, we don't receive the Holy Spirit until after uh, we're converted. And we are born by the Spirit. Everything having to do with our salvation is of the Spirit. The Spirit convicts. The Spirit draws. The Spirit regenerates, the Spirit redeems, the Spirit fills, the Spirit seals. Hey, the power of God dwells within the believer. Amen. You say, I'm waiting for God's power. You've got the power of God. You just need to yield yourself and allow Him 
to have his way in your life. It's a power that has been received. Secondly, it's a power that must be released. You see, the Holy Spirit does not operate automatically. We have him. We received him. But if you don't yield to him, he can't release that power. Amen? In other words, you can quench him. You can grieve him. Amen? And if we're doing that, the power's being quenched. The power's not being released through our lives. In other words, you're not allowing him to do what he has been sent to do in your life. He's not just going to, you're not some possessed creature <laughs> that the Spirit's just going to overtake you and, and overpower you and, and all those. No, listen, you are uh, responsible to yield to him. And when you yield, the power is released in your life. Amen. Oh, the reason a lot of things are not getting done is because a lot of people are quenching the Spirit and they're uh, grieving the Spirit of God. And so a power that has been received, a power that must be released, but I'm glad it's a power that can be relied on. You can trust the power of God. If you yield yourself to Him, He will give you power to do what's right. Amen. And that power will be real. That power, thank God, will help you, amen, if you'll yield yourself to him. And this is where we fall short, is this power that can be relied on. Uh, when Peter acted upon the promise of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit, we find him on his feet in the city uh, where the forces of the, of the Lord, uh, the enemy of the Lord were most strongly entrenched. And oh, how desperately uh, he needed God to help him. And how desperately the church of today needs to move into the attack mode, amen. How desperately we need to yield to the Holy Ghost and allow him to do a work in our heart and in our life. Praise God, Peter was the one that denied the Lord. But after the Holy Ghost came upon him, he yielded to him. He stood boldly that day and preached, amen, and 3,000 people got saved. That's the difference that the power of the Spirit of God, amen, is able to help you and I. It is a power that can be fully relied on. The Christian life is, should be lived, controlled by the will of God. Confident in the power of God and then lastly, concerned for the glory of God. Jesus said, thine is the kingdom, thine is the power and the glory forever. We should be concerned for the glory of God. Amen. And this concern is expressed again and again in the New Testament. Romans 1, 21, uh, Paul names the root sin of the unbeliever. And that is of a failure to glorify God, to give him honor and obedience due, due unto him and the praise unto him, amen. And as Christians, we're told that our obligation was to glorify God in our bodies. That's exactly what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, that you're the, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're to glorify God both in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, we should be concerned about the glory of God, amen, that our life would glorify the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Do all to the glory of God. And in the life of our Lord, this was known as a consuming passion for him. He said, Father, glorify thy name, amen, through his life. 
You and I should have that same desire that our life would glorify the Lord. Amen. How shameful is the reproach done by men, both of unbelievers and, sadly to say, believers. When God is defied, the Spirit is resisted, the Son is rejected, His laws are broken, His days disregarded, His house is empty. Oh, listen, all of those things do not bring glory unto the Lord. Amen? Oh, my. We need to be concerned about the glory of the Lord. You and I tonight, I'm glad we can bring glory to the Lord. When Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and he looked over the city, the Bible says that he wept over it. Oh, the city was doing anything but giving glory to the Lord. And I believe you and I tonight, we need to make sure that our life is glorifying the Lord. Amen? Everything that we do should be to the glory of God, no matter what it is. If it can't be done to the glory of God, what good is it? Amen? Our lives should be uh, glorifying the Lord. I was reading something about an individual, and uh, he went to hear a great choir and a great orchestra, and they were singing a song in glory to God. And when they came to the end of that great song, with the singing of the hallelujah chorus, and they all stood, and at that tremendous anthem of praise and worship, glorifying God as it rang out, hallelujah, hallelujah, King of kings, Lord of lords, hallelujah. And when the music had stopped, there was a man, a saintly man, said with tears running down his face, it's my Savior they're singing about. It's my Savior they're singing about. Hey, that's what we should be doing. Our lives should be glorifying the Lord that others can see Christ in us. Tonight, he's worthy of glory. He's worthy of adoration. He's worthy of obedience. He's worthy of sacrifice. Amen. There should be a concern uh, uh, from our life for the glory of God. Oh, my. I believe that's exactly where we need to be tonight. The Christian life should be lived in three aspects. Thine is the kingdom, controlled by the will of God. Thine is the power, confident in the power of God. And thine is the glory, concerned for the glory of God. I wonder tonight, what is our life? What is the biggest concern in our life? Is our biggest concern doing the will of God? Do we seek out the will of God from day to day in our own lives? Do we seek out to live for God and, and be controlled and, uh, by the will of God and to be reliant on the power of God and that all that we do will bring glory to God? That's the Christian life. That's the kind of life we should be living. Every day you live, if you go to work, go to school, go shopping, whatever you're doing, no matter where you're at, at any moment, your life should give glory to the Lord. <laughs> Anywhere you are, your life should give glory unto the Lord. But it'll never happen if we're not controlled by the will of God and not confident in the power of God. There will be no glory to God without that in our lives. Father, I want to thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. God, thank you that you can help us, help me, Lord, in my life. That, Lord, my life will be concerned with these things. 
Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Oh, God, help us tonight to know the will of God, to be involved and do the will of God. And Lord, when we do that, it'll bring glory to God. Thank you, Father, for the day. Thank you for the word of God that's helped us, Lord, throughout this day. And Lord, if we don't know the will of God, help us to tune in to the word of God Read the Word, study the Word, follow the Word, hide the Word. For God, that is a way that you are going to speak to us and show us through your Word. God, help us tonight. Oh, Father, may we yield ourselves to him, the Holy Spirit. God, may our lives bring glory to your name. We'll thank you, we'll praise you. And give you glory for what you've done and doing. For we ask it in Jesus' name. While we stand tonight, our heads are bowed. Do you know the will of God? Are you confident in the power of God? Are we living every day to bring glory? To the Lord. Paul said he wanted his life to bring glory unto the Lord, whether it be by life or by death. Paul was just concerned that his whole life would bring glory to the Lord Jesus. You know why? Because he wanted other people to know Christ. And tonight, you and I do you realize tonight you're a walking billboard through this world that people can see Christ in you either glorifying the Lord or bringing reproach on the Lord. God help us. God help us. Father, thank you for Victory Baptist Church. Thank you for every home. Thank you for everyone being here today. Again, Lord, I pray for the many that are sick. God, you touch them. Raise them up. Oh, God, encourage your people. Help us to live for you, serve you, honor you, glorify you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Appreciate you being here throughout the day today. Hope you have a great week this week. And, of course, Wednesday night, our midweek service, 730. Living in Victory starts at 730. And so we hope to see you on Wednesday night. Invite somebody to come with you. And then, of course, pray much for one another. Amen. Uh, in these days. Thank you for being here today. And uh, the Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday night.